Hello, I'm Renton McLaughlin. Green MP Sue Bradford has repeatedly said that if her so-called anti-smacking bill goes through, the police are not going to arrest all parents who smack their children. This is one of the clichés she uses as a sweetener to allay the legitimate fears of the 80 to 90 percent of parents throughout the country who oppose her. The police will not arrest all parents who smack their children. I've come to the conclusion that this is an intentional ploy to blow smoke in people's eyes and be deceptively correct in what she says. She's right that not all parents who smack will be arrested, but that's beside the point. What emphatically is correct is that some parents will be arrested and have their children taken off them, and that is appalling. There may be some who aren't concerned by this because they think it unlikely to happen to them. But I'm concerned if it happens to anyone, not just me or those closest to me. And it could be you, or it could be your children as they correct their children, or your neighbours or a workmate. It could be a member of your church group or rugby or tiddlywinks club. But there's no question whatsoever that some poor suckers are going to be arrested and lose their kids and have their lives turned upside down and their family destroyed for simply correcting their children. Bradford was recently asked twice if it would please her if this happened. She totally evaded answering the question both times. For her, people seem to be abstract concepts, numbers to be crunched for political ends, not living people of flesh and blood. For her, it's clearly of no consequence if some people are destroyed by her legislation. Bradford and a host of her supporters, many of whom seem to have wormed their way to the top of so-called child advocacy groups like Plunkett, Bernardo's Save the Children, Epoch, SIFS, uh, Every Child Counts, etc., spoke with relish and unrestrained glee in the early days of this debate of a woman in Timaru who whipped her son with a horsewhip and who was then in a jury trial led off on the basis of Section 59 of the Crimes Act. In fact, this woman became the poster girl for their rabid anti-Section 59 campaign. They said she had abused her son and should never have been acquitted. And despite her acquittal, Sifts refused to give her son back. It took a long time for these people to start speaking the truth and identifying the horsewhip as in fact a riding crop, something very different to a whip. But by then they'd made a lot of mileage out of the untruth they'd told. As more facts about the case became known and put before the public, their use of this case was quietly dropped. The facts do not support their position, and the misinformation they spread about it did them no good. The facts destroy their case and show the behaviour of state agencies up in a very bad light. Most people seem to have heard about the Timaru lady, but not all have heard the facts of the matter. Well, here briefly is an outline of what happened. The mother was called to her son's school after her son, who had behaviour problems, had deliberately kicked a hole in a door and verbally abused the deputy principal. The deputy principal asked the mother to take the boy home to discipline him as he was out of control. The mother duly picked up the boy from school, took him home and discussed his behaviour with him. He bent over the table and she smacked his trousered bottom about six times with a small bamboo cane, 500 millimetres or so long, in a calm and controlled manner. This left a small red mark which disappeared within about an hour. The boy apologised for his behaviour and was returned to school where he apologised to the teacher and changed his behaviour for the better. A couple of weeks later, at home, the boy refused to help his stepfather bring wood into the house. He picked up a baseball bat and swung it full force at his stepfather's head. Fortunately, the stepfather was able to block the blow. If the bat had made contact with his head, it could have killed him. Obviously, if his stepfather had died, very serious consequences for the then 12-year-old boy would have followed. The mother took the boy aside, spoke to him, and then, holding the boy by the arm, disciplined him with a riding crop administered to his trousered bottom. This did not leave any welts, bruises, or any other mark. Bradford has often claimed welts were on the boy, but this is totally contrary to the facts presented in the court. The boy apologised for his behaviour, and his behaviour improved radically for the better. He was a pleasure to have both around at home and at school in the weeks that followed. Neither of these instances of discipline were in anger. The mother was controlled, and the discipline effective. 
It also needs to be said that the mother had previously tried all sorts of other non-physical discipline over a period of years with this boy, to no avail. His behaviour did not improve by encouraging and praising good behaviour, by telling him off, by time out, loss of privilege, grounding or start charts. He had simply run amok at home and school without respect for others or their property. These two incidences of physical correction were the first discipline to be effective. After he had been disciplined for kicking the door in, a meeting was called at school to discuss the boy's behaviour and progress. A social worker from the special education services attended. The deputy principal opened the meeting by saying there had been a huge improvement in the boy's behaviour at school and asked how things were at home. She was told the same had been experienced there. The social worker then asked uh, what was thought to have brought about this change for the better and was told about the incidences of the discipline. At this, the social worker went purple and nearly fell off his seat. He said you weren't allowed to discipline in this manner, that it was against the law even to smack. He was told he was wrong, that there was no law against this and that the discipline had worked. Even though the school acknowledged the radical change for the better in the son's behaviour, this social worker contacted SIFS. SIFS then took the son away from his mother and pressurised the police to charge her with assault, which they reluctantly did five months later. What's incredible is that SIFS removed the boy from his home because they disagreed with the method of discipline the mother had used on the boy and completely overlooked the improvement for the better in his behaviour that it had brought about. The mother was tried by a jury of intelligent people and included citizens from all walks of life including grandparents, professional people, mums and dads and even a school teacher. She gave no evidence in her defence and called no witnesses. The case was decided on prosecution evidence alone. The jury made their unanimous decision based on all the facts of the case and acquitted the mother deciding the verdict in less than an hour. Despite Sif's promise to return the boy if the mother was acquitted, they did not. Now, three years later, the boy, who is almost 15 and six inches bigger than his mother, is desperate to live at home again, and the mother is still fighting Sif's to have him return to her care. This mother was acquitted, but the state has seen her punished in a most heinous way by withholding her child from her when she was found to be not guilty even though proven in a court of law to be innocent of wrongdoing, she's been treated by SIFS as guilty. Those who claim this mother got off are wrong. The psychological damage caused to the boy by SIFS removing him from a family who loved him enough to put an end to his bad behaviour will be lifelong and far outweighs the effects of 30 seconds of pain he experienced to his buttocks and discipline. And the SIFS solution to bad behaviour? Drag him up on a Risperdale. The side effects of this are much worse than the effects an occasional whack on the bottom would have. Nothing can ever give the boy back the years he has lost with his family, some of the most important ones of his life, and the mother is still fighting sis for custody. The boy now lives next door with his grandfather, having run away from Sif's care last November. He can visit any time, but is not allowed to stay, just in case he gets smacked again. Sifts have told the mother that if she uses any type of physical discipline with the, when the boy is at home, they will remove him from the grandfathers. If the mother does not comply with this, the department will have her charged with assault again and remove the boy's younger sister who remains with her mother. Sifts views even the slightest of smacks as violence. The boy is totally disrespectful of adults and rules as a result of Sifts' positive parenting. He needs discipline, and his parents cannot do so out of fear their family will be further destroyed. The mother is concerned that if her son continues on the path he's on, he will end up in prison. The state has made her powerless to effectively discipline and parent her children. She loves her children and wants the best for them. State intervention has prevented this.